So welcome everyone, uh, both to those who, who are participating live here and those of you who will see this recording. Um, today, we, our journal club will be on coherent scattering of low mass dark matter from optically trapped sensors. And uh, it will be uh, a paper that was published in, in PhysRev Letters by Gadi Effect, David Moore, Daniel Carney, and uh, this will be moderate, um, This session will be moderated by Raphael Long, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. I just have just a couple of quick slides. Um, one thing we always like to show is that there are a lot of metrics of how journals do, and this is kind of a fun one, which is every year when the Nobel Prize is announced, um, there are a number of papers that are associated with that prize, and kind of amazingly for the last 11 years in a row, either with a physics or a chemistry prize, there's been a uh, PRL associated with the prize. And so we made this cute infographic. I'm gonna see if we can make it to 12. Well, I don't know, <laughs> we'll see. Um, and then there's, uh, this is the letter that is actually being talked about today. And you know, you know if dark matter is detected, Via optically trapped sensors, who knows? Um, so just a very quick um, reminder, probably everybody knows how to use Zoom at this point, but um, the most important thing at the lower left is your mute button. Please, everybody, unless you're one of the speakers, mute yourselves, mute yourself now. Um, at some point, when you're, if you're asked to, to ask a question, then you can unmute yourself, but please stay muted otherwise. Speaking of uh, asking a question under reactions, there's a raise your hand button. That's what you should use to um, uh, cue yourself up to ask a question. Um, there can also be conversation in chat, but the easiest way to see yourself to be recognized is to raise your hand. And lastly, um, the, the view button in the upper right can allow you to toggle between seeing um, the gallery view and the speaker view, and that many people find that useful. So uh, I guess we're still seeing this, but um, so I, I just want to introduce Raphael now. And then I will turn it over to him and he will run the whole thing. So uh, Raphael Long is a professor of physics and astronomy at Purdue University in Indiana. He obtained his PhD working on the Crest Dark Matter Search at the Max Planck Institute for Physics in Germany. He then joined the Xenon collaboration, first as a postdoc post postdoc uh, at Columbia University and then at Purdue. He chairs the supernova early warning system, which looks for neutrinos from galactic supernovae. He recently founded the Windchime collaboration, which uses a large array of mechanical accelerometers to search for dark matter, matter particles with masses near the Planck mass through their gravitational interactions alone. And so I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to you, Raphael. Thank you very, very much to the APS, PRL, and uh, the staff there for this fantastic opportunity. Um, it is a great pleasure to introduce some of my good friends. Uh, Dave Moore, who did his undergrad at Yale, a PhD at Caltech with Sunil Golava on the Super CDMS experiment, a postdoc at Stanford with Giorgio Bratta, mostly on EXO, I think. And then he returned to Yale as a faculty in 2016, where he is still as an associate professor. And his research focuses on experimental study of neutrinos, dark matter, and gravity, as we will see. Uh, Gadi is a postdoc in David's group and uh, hint, hint, currently looking for faculty positions. He did his undergrad at uh, Ben Gurion in Israel and his PhD with Nir Davidson at the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And we have with us Dan Carney, who is really a trained string theorist, accidentally turned quantum information theorist. Uh, so that was kind of a, a good transition with a PhD at the University of Texas, Austin with uh, Willie Fisher and Sonia Pabau and uh, postdocs at the University of British Columbia with uh, Philip Stamp and then eventually at NIST with Jake Taylor. And since last year, he is a staff at Berkeley. So uh, already from that, you see we're all the dark matter guys here. Uh, and yet we're talking about a measurement using AMO techniques and looking at the, I think participants here, it is exciting to exactly cross cut across those two communities and see, I think, and, and tell you about what is, I think, from my point of view, 
part of a, of a push really that is happening in the dark matter communities to use more and more of the advances made in the AMU community and apply them to the study of dark matter. And so without much more ado, uh, please, uh, Gadi, take it away. Thank you so much, Rafael. I'll try to share my screen. All right, can you see? We can see that, it looks great. And for I people to ask questions, the presentation is going to be relatively brief. Uh, so if you have questions, please just raise your hand and we'll take all those in the order that you raised your hand after the presentation. Thank you. All right, so thanks, Rafael, and thank you. I want to thank the organizers for this great, great opportunity. I'm really humbled to um, be presenting our work at uh, such, a, such an amazing venue. Um, Let's get right to it. So I'm going to talk about um, <clears throat> coherent scattering of low mass dark matter. I'll give a relatively long introduction because uh, uh, this is probably a, a very wide audience. Um, and, and, and the way we're going to try to measure this or the way we propose to measure this is using levitated optomechanics, such as you can see here um, in our lab at Yale. Uh, this is a levitated uh, 10 micron see all right so this is a levitated 10 micron silica sphere in the center of a vacuum chamber uh, trapped on a laser beam and this is what we propose or more or less what we propose to use for uh, um, dark matter detection in a kind of a new way and before i start you you already saw them but these are the uh, uh, great great co-authors of this paper dan carney and and my advisor dave Moore. so I thought I'd start us off with uh, this beautiful picture of the Andromeda galaxy, our neighbor, whose uh, rotation curves, namely the velocity of the stars as a function of their distance from the center of the, uh, of the uh, um, galaxy, uh, as observed um, um, initially by, by Vera Rubin, um, are one of the evidence not the only by no means, but one of the most compelling evidence that we have that there is more to um, uh, matter than meets the eye. So um, there are other types of evidence. Um, cosmology now tells us exactly in terms of numbers how uh, much of the energy budget in the universe is made of dark matter, roughly 25%. And uh, how much of it is, so this is us, basically, to give you just a sense of proportion. Um, the other things we do know about dark matter is we know it's electrically, it's electrically neutral. I'm writing ish here, but let's not go into that now. And it interacts very weakly with normal matter. Otherwise, we would have found it by now. Uh, we know it's stable, at least in the timescales of the universe. Um, it's cold, so by that I mean slow and massive, and, and for, by massive I mean it interacts via gravity with normal matter. Uh, it's non-baryonic, and uh, if we um, look at it, look for it on Earth using a terrestrial sensor, we should be able to see, because the Earth, because of the rotation of the Earth, we should be able to see a modulation, a change in the direction from which this uh, dark matter is kind of sweeping the detector. So this is what we know. What we don't know, we don't know mass, right? So pretty much anywhere between uh, 10 to the minus 57 kilogram to 10 to the 31, so roughly 80, 90 degrees, 90 orders of magnitude in mass, uh, uh, dark matter can be. There's models uh, um, uh, justifying it in, in different places around this scale. But this is really, really, really looking for a needle in a haystack. So. Let's think of what we like to call a model independent search. There's a standard model with all of its richness. That's only 20% of matter, more or less 20% of matter as we know it. And we know it interacts using gravity with dark matter. So how would a model independent search look like? Let's do this thought experiment uh, described in this paper by Dan and also kind of the basic foundation for this, uh, for the, the very nice wind chime project. And what I want you to imagine is the following. Think of an array of pendulum, which 
you were somehow able to uh, disconnect all or to turn off all other interactions it has with matter except gravity. And now I want you to imagine a dark matter particle kind of whooshing through this uh, um, array of sensors. And because it interacts with gravity, via gravity, use, uh, with these other, uh, with these uh, pendula, we're going to see them move. And if we can measure the movement, the correlated movement of such uh, um, um, pendula, then we should be able to detect only gravitationally the um, uh, interaction with dark matter. Now, the, the, the thing is that when you put numbers in here, then you realize this is very, very ambitious. You need to be able to measure with astounding precision, I write here 30 dB beyond the standard quantum limit, which, which I will explain a little bit later. It has to be very cold um, for reduction of thermal noise. And you have to have a billion sensors, each of them a milligram mass and so on. So at this point, this is very ambitious. Um, so, so that leads to, to the question, what, what can we measure? And what we can measure, maybe, is what happens if, and this is well allowed and well justified, if dark matter interacts not only using gravity, but also using other types of mechanisms, such as long range forces and weak mixing. And what I want to claim now is that optomechanical sensors are extremely well adapt, adapted um, um, systems to look for such, uh, such weak interactions. Um, they're very precise for sensors. And at this point, and at this point as a community, we know how to control uh, if someone who's not muted. Um, at this point as a community, we know how to control uh, um, such masses from kilogram type masses at LIGO down to a single atom, so a single ion in a, in a fall trap here at this, in this example. And just for orientation in our lab here at Yale, um, we're kind of in the middle of this logarithmic scale, uh, looking at roughly uh, nanogram objects um, with an acceleration sensitivity of around 100 nano G, G here is Earth's gravitational G, per root hertz, and this is still technically limited. And I want to point out that this brings us to levitated optomechanical sensors. And the nice thing about levitated optomechanical sensors is that you can use them to sense momentum kicks, which I'm going to talk about in a second. Now, the last thing maybe I want to say here is that the quantum revolution in terms of quantum measurement techniques is already underway and people are, are um, pushing these objects to uh, uh, the quantum ground state and, and um, measurement techniques trying to squeeze light and do uh, things like that are already kind of uh, maturing. Um, now the technique we use or a technique we want to describe is that of optical tweezers, basically trapping particles using uh, forces from light beams. And I, I wanted to show this beautiful picture of, of Art Ashkin and Steve Chu uh, at Bell Labs, both of them Nobel Prize laureates, of course, uh, which basically started the, this whole thing. Uh, and, and that kind of um, branched out to various different types of physical systems like um, single molecule biophysics in, in fluids and even trapping single atoms in, in tweezer array. This is a, a beautiful picture where each spot of light is a single trapped atom in a 3D um, 3D array. So usually when people look for dark matter, they look for the energy that the dark matter deposits. So imagine uh, a big tank of something, and then some dark matter particle comes in and it collides or deposits in some way its energy in some one or two or one constituent of the system and then uh, goes out and this energy, the system responds in the form it spits out something. So it can be electrons, it can be photons, it can be whatever. And, and this result of this interaction of this energy deposit is then detected at fantastic precision. And pretty much 100% of uh, terrestrial searches for dark matter work like this. 
in, in general. Now, one can ask if you have a levitated object, what if we can look instead of energy, if we can look at the momentum deposit that the, a, a dark matter particle gives. So a dark matter particle comes and it kicks our sensor and the sensor recoils. And if we can measure this recoil, um, uh, then we can, we can learn something about the interaction. And, and one advantage here is, is that all of the momentum imparted into your uh, sphere, let's say, or levitated object goes into center of mass motion from just from momentum conservation, goes into the center of mass motion of your object. So this is what you have to measure. Now, rightfully so, one might ask, well, <laughs> there's a huge mass difference, right? Because typical experiments, or let's say, uh, best generation, new generation experiments have something like a ton of material, let's say xenon in a tub, whereas our little tiny object is a nanogram or even a femtogram of, of, of material. So there's a huge, more or less Avogadro number uh, of, of mass difference here. And, and if the uh, dark matter particle interacts with, with your material, with your mass, then there's a, there's a huge problem. here. So how do you overcome this problem? And the answer is uh, uh, in quantum mechanics and, and it's, it's in coherent scattering. Now, what do we mean by coherent scattering? What we mean is if your incoming dark matter particle or if, you're, if the momentum transferred by your dark matter particle, the inverse momentum, some would say, uh, or you can call it the, the Broly wavelength of your incoming particle is of the size of your sensor, then what happens is that this dark matter particle can't tell with which of the nucleons in the, in the sensor it's interacting, and therefore it kind of interacts with all of them together at once. And what quantum mechanics tells us is that the cross-section for such an interaction goes quadratic with the number of nucleons, let's say, if it's a nuclear interaction, in your sensor. So if our little tiny uh, uh, sphere has 10 to the 15 nucleons, then using this coherent enhancement, you can uh, uh, get an enhancement of 10 to the power of 30, which is a huge, huge amplifier. So these are the basic ingredients. We're going to have a levitated object. We're going to have some sort of coherent scattering, uh, which augments the, the cross-section for interaction. And uh, uh, by measuring the center of mass motion of this sensor, we're going to see if we can learn something about uh, um, dark matter interactions. Now, I want to point out this first demonstration uh, um, published in 2020 in PRL uh, from our group, where we were looking at a nanogram sphere interacting with very heavy dark matter particles. Um, and for this, uh, so, so the idea here is that you look for a, uh, an interaction mediated by some long range force carrier. And the, the, the thing is that if your, um, if your interaction is mediated by some long range, is, is very long range, then you can generate this coherence by the fact that the, the, the dark matter particle, again, doesn't really know which nucleon, which nucleon in, the, in the sensor it's interacting with. And then you get this enhancement in the cross-section of, of around 10 to the 30, 10 to the uh, 29. And we, we really did this experiment. We went into the lab, we trapped here, and we looked at the displacement. This is the displacement of the sphere, of the center of mass in nanometers. So this is two nanometers as a function of time. As we hit this, for example, is a calibration measurement where we simulate a, 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 a kick by some momentum of dark matter. And what the sphere does is it recoils and it does so like a driven damped harmonic oscillator. So it's sitting in, in the trap, it gets kicked by a dark matter particle and then it just uh, rings down. And um, our momentum threshold in these uh, natural theorist units is, uh, was around 200 uh, MeV mega electron volt per C. This is like feeling an E. coli land on your shoulder from 10 meter height, more or less. So this is very sensitive. Um, 
and, and we needed for this two things. We needed the long range interaction and we needed the dark matter to be very heavy. There are models that, that, uh, um, that show this. Um, and, and what we got in this very first proof of principle experiment is that we already go well beyond the existing searches. So what we see here in this plot is the upper limit that we measure on the coupling of dark matter to neutrons. That's the strength of this interaction potential alpha n as a function of the dark matter mass here in GeV per C square. And this is what we measured in this very first initial search. This is a, a limit plot. Um, and here's how you can improve it for the next steps. So the first thing you could do is you could just have more sensors. So if you have a 10 by 10 array of such spheres and, and you could integrate at the current noise level for one year, then you get here. And if you uh, had the same array and could integrate it at the standard quantum limit, then you, can get, you could get here. Now, another thing that's worth maybe mentioning is that um, when you look for energy deposits, energy is a scalar, you lose, you wash out the information on the directionality, which if you remember, we mentioned that the, the directionality should be modulated at a daily, um, at a very specific uh, uh, rate. And that would be a, a real smoking gun evidence because no background would do this, only dark matter. Um, so since you measure momentum, momentum is a vector, it has a direction, and you should be able to look at the direction from which the kicks are coming from if you were to measure these kicks. Going to large sensor arrays and pushing beyond the standard quantum limit. Now, if you could do that, you would be sensitive to different types of dark matter models, which is in itself, uh, in itself interesting. And this brings us to the lower dark matter mass. So up until now, we were talking about masses which are high, and we needed long range, long range interactions. But what if you, and that's granted a little bit of a, um, uh, some sort of, not very mainstream in terms of dark matter models. The more mainstream models use massive mediators. Um, and weak interaction. So among those, you can find the WIMPs, the weakly interacting massive particles. I'm not going to talk about axions today, even though they're also relevant. And the thing with these WIMPs, with the, the, they're one of the leading candidates, people have been looking for them for decades now, and unfortunately not finding anything. Um, however, under, in, in masses under the WIMP sort of WIMP scale, the current um, sensors that people have been building for so long, they fall in terms of sensitivity. The, the threshold is just uh, uh, not there. So if you were to build a detector that is sensitive to this sort of mass scale, that would open up new opportunities. And indeed, people are looking. So this is a recent plot um, two years ago, and it's already outdated of different types of systems that are used to probe this uh, mass range, starting from KEV up to a GEV, uh, using a wide variety of detectors and detecting detection systems, Nobel liquid semiconductors and so on. Um, but they're all looking for energy. Now, if you look uh, uh, far enough, then there's this beautiful paper by Peter Smith from 2003 um, suggesting exactly what we're going to talk about. And it says, if you were to set up a levitated array of small granules, um, each with, with which individual interactions would result in a very small mechanical recoil, such a detector may become possible in the future. Um, and we think that this future is now, is now close. So here's what we suggest. Um, in this paper, the, the, in this earlier paper, the proof of concept we talked about, we had spheres which were 10 microns in, in radius, more or less, and with a threshold, threshold momentum sensitivity of around 100 times worse than the standard quantum limit. Um, this forced us to consider dark matter models where the mass of the dark matter is very large, 100 GeV. And we had to have a long range um, light mediator. Now, one would, and, and, and so this is a huge, 
huge ish, 10 micron sphere. And, and one might ask, what happens if you were to use a very small sphere, much smaller? It just, it's just reasonable that if you have a smaller object, then for, uh, you, your recoil sensitivity would be much better. And indeed, that's the case. So if we kind of zoom in onto this sphere, so this is uh, to scale, this is the, this sphere. And now let's talk about these guys. So if this was 10 microns, now let's talk about spheres that are 200 microns in uh, diameter or 100 in radius. And these spheres are actually have been demonstrated to by this, these um, two fantastic uh, groups, uh, Marcus Espelmeyer's group in Vienna and, and uh, Lucas Novotny's group in Zurich to be uh, cooled. So their uh, center of mass motion was cooled to the quantum uh, ground state, which indicates that you could measure momentum recoils at the standard quantum limit. So for these uh, systems, the inverse momentum transfer or the coherence is of the order of the size of a nucleus in the sphere. But even if it interacts only with a nucleus, we expect that the, the, since all of this momentum goes to the center of mass motion, we expect that this would be a measurable um, um, uh, quantity. Now what happens if you go even smaller so if you take this tiny sphere and you blow it up and, and look at this one, which is only 15 nanometers in, in uh, diameter, then here, the inverse momentum or the de Broglie wavelengths of the dark matter, the low mass dark matter with weak interaction, so massive mediators, is already of the order of the entire sphere. And this gives you the huge um, um, amplification of quantum mechanics of coherent interaction where if, there's a, if, there is a, if there are a million, let's say, um, constituents, a million nuclei in this sphere, you get 10 to the 12 uh, enhancement in your cross-section. Another component that could be very useful is to look at large arrays of these nanospheres, right? So, so if you were, to, if you were uh, to be able to build, to construct a large array of these, and maintain the sensitivity, this is a plot taken from Lorenzo's paper in, in uh, Nature, of the position of such a nanosphere, this is a 100 nanometer uh, sphere, as a function of time, this is now um, 0.3 nanometers, right? And what we think, or what Lorenzo thinks it is, it, he's seeing here is a kick from a residual uh, gas atom in, your, in, in his vacuum. And uh, this uh, creates a momentum recoil with a threshold of around 150 keV. So this is already very, very, very low. Um, and this is for a single nanosphere. How would you scale it up? Well, the technology is there, right? Large arrays of, of, of spheres uh, or large arrays of optically trapped and, and electromagnetically trapped particles already exist for atoms, these beautiful uh, um, single atom arrays or single ion objects um, in fluid. And, and this happens all the time. Just before I started presenting, I saw Dave Greer here. So he was one of the pioneers. Um, and, and the scaling of this to, to large, larger and larger systems may be driven by, by the scaling of the quantum computing scene, which is now also striving for more and more and more uh, particles. Now, when you think of a detector like this, you have to consider backgrounds. Usually in these ton scale detectors, the backgrounds are predominantly cosmo cosmological, cos cosmogenical, uh, uh, radiological backgrounds. For this type of sensor, it's a little bit different. Our main limiting background is residual gas. So how good is our vacuum and um, how cold it is, how cold the, the constituents in it are. Because if we consider collisions from H2 molecules, which are there in the vacuum, by reducing the pressure, you can reduce this, they can imitate dark matter um, and fool us. But by reducing the pressure in our vacuum system, we can reduce the event rate very dramatically. And by reducing the temperature, we can reduce the momentum transfer each of these individual kicks gives us. So in this plot, which I'm just going to show kind of very briefly, we show the uh, scattering, the, the scattering uh, rate, differential scattering rate. So these are the number of 
collision events per given momentum in these units of uh, one per year per EV. Um, as a function of the momentum of the of the transferred momentum of the of the collision, and what we show here in solid lines are the dark matter um, calculated dark matter uh, uh, rates, and in these dashed lines we we show the um, the residual gas scattering. So so what you can see, for example, is that for the fifteen nanometer spheres, reducing the pressure at a given temperature helps bring this red line, which is our uh, dark matter, to be above the background. Um, however, for uh, the 200 nanometer spheres, for example, uh, reducing the temperature helps a lot and, and brings this uh, dark matter line to be above the background. And I'm happy to discuss more um, in the questions if anyone asks. And of course, there's other, there's other things we have to worry about, like secondaries from radiogenic and cosmo cosmogenic sources. So if a muon comes and hits a surface in our vacuum chamber and then releases a bunch of stuff, this stuff might collide with our sphere and, and imitate dark matter. Uh, we can think about fluctuations in the black body radiation from surfaces, vibrations, and a whole other bunch of stuff. Um, and this brings me to our uh, main result, which is the um, single nucleon cross section in units of centimeters squared as a function of the mass of the dark matter. And the gray area, the, the, the solid areas here are existing limits. And what you can see is that even with a single sphere integrating for a month with a sensitivity of five times the standard quantum limit, uh, you're already very close to uh, um, seeing new parameter space. And with even a modest array of just 10 by 10 spheres, you're in a month integration, which is very realistic, you're already here into the, into the, the new parameter space. Um, what I'm also showing here in red is, so this is for silica spheres, which are kind of the main workhorse. If one could get spheres made of hafnium oxide, and if anyone knows how to make them, then please, uh, shout out, uh, then that would be better because they have, they're more massive. Um, and if you were able to go to 100 by 100 array, then uh, you could even get here and integrate for a year. However, when you go down to the uh, full coherent case, uh, the very small uh, 15 nanometer spheres, which no one uh, um, has yet to trap in vacuum, then uh, this full coherence gives you uh, this amplification factor of 10 to the power of 12. And even with a very modest array, this 10 by 10, so this uh, black dashed uh, rectangle is the axis limits of this entire plot. So um, these are all the lines that appear here. And then even with a modest 10 by 10 array of these small uh, spheres at the standard quantum limit, then you are already into new parameter space, kind of way, way lower uh, dark matter masses. And with a more ambitious 100 by 100 array, maybe with a little bit of squeezing, then you can even get to this uh, kind of area. Um, and with that, I'll finish and open the stage for questions. Um, but just before, let's, uh, I wanna thank the entire group here at Yale um, and uh, Dan, of course, for uh, helping and, and, and mentoring uh, during the writing of this paper, and Dave, and the funding uh, agencies. And that, I think, I will finish. Thank you very much, Gadi. Um, virtual applause. We do definitely have a lot of time for questions, and I invite a very open uh, discussion. And any question that you're interested in also, not just to the paper and the research, but whatever else might interest you, since we have the authors here, uh, please go ahead. And we already have a couple of questions. You can raise your virtual hand, or I'm just taking the first question that we have here already in the chat, which is from Matt Eager. I'm simply reading it. Matt is asking, is a sphere of 15 nanometers radius still spherical enough? Do we need to start considering the actual shape and discrete composition of the object, or is it close enough? Gadi, you want to take that? Sure. So um, actually, even the large, so, so they're pretty spherical um, up to around maybe a percent level. Um, 
And in fact, uh, what I can say is that the non-sphericity of the spheres is actually not bad for us. Um, it helps us transfer angular momentum to the spheres and with that spin them very fast and avoid different types of backgrounds that, that might exist. Um, another thing to maybe say is that if you're sub wavelength, then the shape doesn't really matter. So um, as long as you're sub wavelength, then, then, then the trapping mechanism is, is, a, is slightly different than with the large wavelength than with the large spheres and the shape is not very influential. Well, that's what made me wonder because this was the this was the point at which you said the the radius was the instead of being uh, comparable to the size of the nucleons, it was comparable to the size of the sphere. So I was wondering if small differences in the actual size of the sphere would start to you know cause problems. So I think that's a, a higher order effect. Uh, there is an optimum, so you can choose the side of the size of your sphere. And there is a, so this um, 15 nanometers represents a well-calculated optimum for having both the sensitivity to the, see the transfer and enough mass such that this quadratic enhancement is, is gives you something. So, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. And maybe just to uh, echo what Gadi said, sorry. Uh, I mean, it's really an amazing uh, feature of modern technology that you can make spherical objects all the way down to 10 nanometers or below with percent level ellipticity. So these are grown in solution and actually form very spherical morphologies such that it's good enough for, you know, uh, everything we're talking about here. Yeah, so only a million atoms in it, right? So it's basically a big molecule, but uh, but it's amazingly spherical. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm moving to the next question that we have in chat from Terry. Uh, this looks like maybe a question for Dan, if I'm not mistaken. Dan, uh, Terry is asking: Entanglement experiments back to Stan Galach involve tiny quantities of transverse momentum. Have you examined whether quantum entanglement could become a cryptic noise source in your experiments? Conversely, could your device uh, possibly, and now Zoom doesn't want to me to read, uh, conversely, could your devices possibly provide new data on entanglement experiments? Yeah, so I guess it's two questions. The In terms of entanglement as a noise, um, I think you know we did, did our best to estimate all the noise backgrounds, and the worst thing would be a very boring noise, which is like Gotti was showing just gas particles in your chamber just smacking into the thing, and that's a pretty classical process. But I think the more like exciting answer to this question is these nano nanograms, uh, sorry, nanometer scale objects are sort of like the frontier in entanglement in like large quantum systems right now. So there's a ton of work where so, so currently the largest uh, system that people, for example, put into spatial superposition is sort of like 10 to the sixth AMU scale objects. These are sort of more like 10 to the nine, 10 to the 10. And then there's a ton of work to put these things in quantum states right now. Um, so that would help the dark matter program. Um, you know, Jess Riedel has been talking about this for about a decade. Um, it, it's also important for quantum gravity tests and a number of other things. So. I, the statement is currently no one has put these things in a non-trivial quantum state, but there's a. I think someone will do it within the next, you know, few years. <clears throat> Thank you, Dan. And the next question comes from a guest in chat. I think this is a good one for Dave, maybe. Dave, why would dark matter detection have a directionality component with respect to the rotation of the Earth? Yeah, so so there's kind of two uh, kind of uh, signatures that often we think about astrophysically just from the properties of dark matter. So we know that dark matter is bound to the Milky Way, and it should be, if it's in the simplest models, it's some halo, spherical halo uh, around the Milky Way. And then, of course, our solar system, the sun is moving through that dark matter halo. It also has some proper motion. Uh, it's also bound to the Milky Way, and in fact, in the spiral arms. Um, and the Earth is getting carried along for the ride. Uh, and so you'll often hear about this annual modulation as the Earth goes around the sun, uh, where there's a kind of uh, famous uh, uh, claim detection that hasn't really been uh, yet verified by the community. Uh, but a, a much kind of more distinct signature is as the Earth spins around, uh, you know, rotates during its day, um, the, the point on the sky where our proper motion through the dark matter halo is pointing changes diurnally throughout the day. 
And so if you can see really three momentum, you can see the direction of that uh, velocity vector of that incoming dark matter particle. You can see that spinning around towards the direction of our motion through uh, the background of the galaxy. And uh, there's not really any known background on the earth. I mean, if we saw something that was pointing in a fixed location in galactic coordinates, it could really only be coming from something astrophysical. And of course, uh, we think that would be dark matter. Thank you. And from David comes a reference suggestion for hafnium oxide nanoparticles, which uh, Gadi, uh, you probably have seen, uh, but uh, Paul is also commenting on palladium oxide being quite massive. Have you, have you considered other oxides? Why, why those two? Yeah, so, uh, um, so hafnium oxide would have uh, more or less the same optical properties that uh, silica would have, making it kind of easier to use. Um, we haven't looked into palladium oxide, no, um, but, but that would be definitely interesting, sure. In, in principle, your paper includes all the details needed to calculate what it would be doing. So at that point, I guess it's also just a question of experimentally, right? What is, what is easier to do is, I think, yeah. a large part of it. Yeah. Okay, we have a question. We have a hand raised by Lassas56. Do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I'm um, sure. So my question is, so within on the model that you're proposing, um, you were talking about for coherent enhancement to occur, you're talking about a long range um, force carrying particle of some sort. Is that entirely sort of a beyond the standard model approach? Or are there, is there other more details you can kind of give to how that would sort of be modeled? Yeah, so I, I guess I can jump in. Um, so there's kind of two ways to get coherent. So it's crucial that you have coherent scattering across the sphere. And one way is that the force is long range and it can kind of feel the whole sphere at once. We've actually done a search of that type uh, for a new force beyond the standard model that would exist uh, between uh, dark matter and normal matter. Um, now, of course, we do know of two long range forces that do exist. I mean, they're gravity and electromagnetism. They're mediated by massless bosons, like the photon um, and, and the graviton. Um, and so, of course, in nature, we know about such forces. Um, unfortunately, as Gadi said at the very beginning of the talk, gravity, we'd love to be able to detect dark matter flying by from its gravitational interaction, but gravity is so incredibly weak. This is a big puzzle of why it's so weak, but it's so weak, it makes that experiment uh, really incredibly hard. And, uh, hopefully, Windchime, uh, which our moderator is uh, playing a leading role in, can get there. Dave, you muted yourself. Yeah, I think the okay, sorry. So already, though, if there's a force much stronger than gravity, um, then we should be able to, you know, use similar kind of ideas to see that. Now, it is beyond the standard model in that there needs to be a force larger than gravity that's also uh, mediated by, uh, you know, a light force carrier. Um, that said, every search that's been done in the laboratory to date has been a beyond the standard model search in that we assume there's some kind of you know, new physics or new force beyond the standard model. Maybe we're using the weak force, but we're definitely assuming a particle beyond the standard model to uh, be the dark matter. Thank you, David. And I think I accidentally muted you there, Jeff. Apologies for that. Anthony is asking, you mentioned squeezing in the last slides, but how do you squeeze an entire array of sensors? Ah, good one. Um, yeah, right. So, so you could do squeezing, uh, which is being done at LIGO, for example. Um, you could also do different other kinds of uh, um, back action evading measurements, like measuring quick pulses. Um, we thought a little bit about that. There's no, I would say we don't have a clear scheme in mind at this point. Um, but again, this, these things have been, have been demonstrated. So LIGO uses, um, you know, squeeze light. You could imagine splitting that up and using that as your detection light for an array. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah, so I'm saying that because uh, I'm sort of playing a devil's advocate. This is something I'm uh, working on uh, theoretically, is uh, taking stuff from the distributed quantum sensing community. And so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I in the simplest case, though, you can think of these as really tweezer arrays. So you can have, if you can do it with one tweezer, you can do it with n tweezers. Now, of course, technologically, you need the, you know, ability to have n squeeze light sources and detectors, all these things. Uh, but 
I think as Gadi said, I mean, there's this huge explosion in quantum technologies and a lot of the technologies you need to realize something like this are exactly the same things you want to trap a million ion qubits. And so if there is a kind of commercial push to develop photonic integrated circuit systems where you can print a wafer with lots of lasers and traps and photo detectors and squeeze light sources on those chips, um, that would be pretty exciting for these kinds of applications. But that's definitely futuristic technology. Well, it turns out you can also, but I'll just say this and then leave you guys alone. turns out you can bypass using in squeezers, um, using techniques from distributed quantum sensing. So I'll just say that. I, I feel like I need to give a bit of, of a perspective on here, right? I think uh, Gadi, David, and Dan will agree with me that the experiment that you're proposing is not one that will be built next year. I think this is a, a long-term development that we are we're. Um, yeah, well, just to finish what he was going to say, <laughs> I think this experiment is probably, you know, on the few to 10 year time scale. <laughs> yeah. So I think like, maybe just to say that I mean, we're thinking pretty actively, you know, about how to do quantum enhanced measurements with more than one device. That's like a, as you're clearly aware big open question, super interesting. So, you know, I think we're all looking forward to developments in that for the next couple of years. I think Raphael, are you frozen? Are you there? Uh, somehow my computer is getting slower and slower with every question that is being posed. Uh, sorry for that. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, um, I think we'll just push on to the next question. From Kaufman, uh, could one use macromolecules as the levitated particles, proteins, other biomolecules are the right size and are very. Okay, so Raphael froze again, but I think I can try to answer. Um, the key thing here is the vacuum. And if you could uh, presume, so molecules tra uh, are being trapped, um, living cells are being trapped in fluid all the time, but the, the uh, force or momentum recoil sensitivity that you can get there is not good enough. Uh, if you could trap a thing, a thing like that in, um, in ultra high vacuum without it degrading and keeping its structural integrity, then it would probably be similar. Yeah. Yeah, and just to say, I mean, along those lines, the largest objects that we've seen quantum kind of, you know, interference effects for are in Marcus Arndt's group at University of Vienna, and these are giant macro molecules, in this case, synthetic ones rather than ones existing in nature, but, uh, you know, uh, not biologically active molecules, but you can see quantum effects, you know, uh, at a substantial, you know, the total mass is smaller than these nanospheres by several orders of magnitude, but you can still, you know, send these through a diffraction gradient and see really interesting effects. I'll try again, despite keeping being frozen, uh, just going through the questions one by one. From Ricci, uh, great work. You mentioned you want to push this measurement towards the standard quantum limit. Do you have any plan? I guess that's the question mark right there. Or if you want to continue, do you have any plan to how to prepare such a large sphere in the ground state? And is it, is it possible to entangle spheres? So the spheres of this size have been prepared in the ground state already. I think that's a, a key thing to take away from this talk. Not by uh, Dave and Gotti, although they will do it, but by, by a couple groups in Europe. Um, Gotti can talk about plans. And for the, and for the large, uh, so the key there, maybe I can say, is just uh, is, is your ability to collect enough photons or enough information about the position of the sphere in an efficient way. And this, uh, as, as Dan said, has been done by, uh, by Aspelmeyer's group and by uh, Lucas Novotny's group. Um, for the large spheres that we work on more kind of regularly, the, the 10 micron spheres or so, at this point, we're about 100 times uh, above the standard quantum limit, but we are technically limited and are working hard to try to uh, get better there. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'll just echo, I'm actually at a levitated optimal mechanics meeting this week where the community's here and there's a huge amount of progress in this field. Uh, when we were here just before the pandemic, uh, none of the things we just said were true. Uh, and, you know, two years before that, you know, people had barely trapped these objects in modern systems. So the derivative, you know, towards really seeing quantum phenomena in these kinds of 
uh, nanoscale objects, you know, the community is really making extremely rapid progress. And, and, you know, on the year of, you know, the time scale of, you know, years, not decades, I think we'll have an even larger variety of systems uh, kind of in this regime. Thank you. And a question on how come that the optimum size of the detecting sphere is about 50 nanometers, which assumption about dark matter actually go in that? Well, so you take the, so you know the uh, velocity more or less of the dark matter and you take its mass as, as, a or, or as a function of mass, you search for the size of the scattering rate and the scattering rate is also a function of, of the size of your sphere because that obviously relates to the number of nucleons you have there. And you can imagine just kind of intuitively as your sphere becomes smaller and smaller, it becomes more sensitive, but it has less mass to, to, to give you a large cross-section. And as it becomes very large, it has much more mass, but much less uh, uh, sensitivity, recall sensitivity. And so it just turns out that for silica, the optimum is 15 nanometers. Lucky for us. Yeah. If I may ask a second question to this. Um, so, so the only property of dark matter, if I understood you correctly, is the velocity. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. And maybe we take the question next from Christopher Thomas, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, so I had a question uh, that you used uh, levitated uh, sensors. So does that sensors uh, have its own electromagnetic field or some other field? Because you guys said you were only considering gravitational field. So does that sensor poses a threat or a little bit deviation from your you know, optimum level of uh, calculation system or something like that? And what did you guys do to rectify it? I don't know if it's relevant or not, but still- No, it's a great that. question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> uh, so, so first of all, let me point out that they were very, very far from uh, looking at gravitational interaction with these things. Okay, so th that's far away and that maybe Raphael uh, is, can comment on. Um, however, electromagnetism is, is an immense background, right? Uh, it's very strong. And for the spheres we use in our lab, we know how to neutralize these spheres um, to exactly zero excess charges, right? So we know how to make sure that they, on this, let's say 10 to the 15 nucleon object, there is exactly the same number of uh, uh, protons and electrons. Now that's great because it gets rid at first order of this problem. Then you have dipoles. So you worry about dipoles as well. So you can spin the sphere and you can play other kinds of tricks, but that's definitely the leading or one of the leading sources of, of noise. But there are tricks you can do, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, good question. Uh, next one is, I'm just going through the list from David uh, Greer. Uh, from the AMO perspective saying the force landscape created by a single beam optical trap includes a non-conservative non-conservative component that influences a trapped particle's trajectory. How important is your assumption that the optical force field is conservative and harmonic? Yeah, so I guess, I mean, this is a very good point. And um, uh, of course, in the fluid-based optical tweezers led by your group, uh, you know that these forces are, are really super important. Um, I think there's a couple differences in the vacuum-based tweezers uh, from the work in fluid. Um, uh, maybe the kind of most important one in this context is that we can actually cool the motion of the sphere with uh, uh, feedback cooling. So watching the motion and when it's moving with high velocity, pushing against it a bit to slow it down. And we've cooled the larger objects to uh, 50 micro Kelvin or you know, lower effective temperatures than you can even get in the best dilution fridge. Uh, and people have reached similar te temperatures when cooling to the ground state. Obviously, these are in the ground state. So at some point, your cooling becomes limited by the zero point motion in the harmonic potential rather than uh, kind of classical forces. Um, so, so these things are incredibly still. And because of that, the kind of non-conservative forces that come from orbits in these traps are substantially reduced. Um, and so it's a definitely an incredibly important thing in the vacuum traps for being able to pump the sphere from air pressure down to low pressure, where these forces actually are the main reason why since Ashkin and you know for decades, people had not really developed these traps in, uh, in the level they've been in the past 10 years. Uh, but once they're trapped and cold at, at uh, low pressure, um, the things driving those kinds of non-conservative forces we think mainly go away. 
Um, now, of course, if at some point we did get limited by that kind of stuff, uh, you can do protocols where you turn off the laser. If you're ever limited by the optical forces, uh, you do need the laser for measurement, at least in most of these schemes, uh, but you can in principle turn off the laser for brief periods without, you know, and then catch the particle again and get rid of all the optical noise. That's nice you go into the free fall. A related question coming on from Vinayak, uh, which is, David, maybe you can take this one as well. How do the magnetic forces play a role, particularly if you have spin zero to higher integral spin bosons? Yeah, so, okay, so excellent question. So to date, we've seen uh, really significant couplings to background electromagnetism. So stray electric fields, things like this, as Gadi said, and we've developed a lot of technology to be able to like, control the net charge and the multipole moments. Um, we haven't, these are amorphous silica spheres, uh, which have low enough magnetic impurities that the first order, we don't see strong magnetic effects on the, on the spheres. So we've luckily mostly been facing only one of the two electromagnetic forces. Um, but at some point you may have to worry about magnetic impurities. That's definitely true. Um, uh, and so that's something you need to, like many people do, maybe shield the magnetic fields, things like this. So, so it's possibly a technical challenge, but we haven't yet gotten to the sensitivity levels where we've seen it. Thank you, David. And then continuing from Clarence Liu, you mentioned that a one month integration time is realistic, but could you comment on that, uh, how it's being done and, you know, um, uh, in context, I can give you one context from direct dark matter detection where usually, you know, month or years long uh, experiments are certainly run. Those experiments can run for, you know, four or five years, even longer, and uh, still try to search for, you know, a few or a handful of events. But that's, of course, particle physics methods which is the background of some of the authors of this paper. And so, yeah, indeed, here we're going, in, I think, into a, with, with a different mindset into a community, which to me is some of the appeal, if I may say, of, of this entire push to really marrying at the uh, interface of those two communities, what is, what is possible and what can be done. But maybe, uh, Dave, do you want to comment more on this one month integration time? Sure, yeah. So uh, as Raphael said, I mean, for, for better or worse, the the you know for very rare events including dark matter but other rare event searches we do now in fundamental physics uh when it takes a long time to build the experiment you want to run it for really years at a time um it's kind of the natural uh length of time to run some of these searches um you don't want to run for decades because you know students uh other people are only around for a few years but but a year is we think reasonable and in fact these particles are stably in the trap for those time periods the depth of these traps are 10 to the five Kelvin or something. So uh, if no one turns off the power in the lab or things like that, we, we've had stable particles, the same particle in a trap for a month long times, uh, no problem. And so there's no fundamental reason with a well-engineered system, you can't run them for this amount of time. Uh, the, the key will be getting the backgrounds low enough so that you only see you know, a handful of background account, uh, events in those uh, quite long time periods. Yeah, maybe I can tap into, uh, Raphael, what you said and about the units that don't always fit between communities. So typical exposure of uh, high energy physics experiments is measured in ton years, mass and time of running. So the experiment that I showed, the proof of principle experiment is three nanogram days. Okay, so sometimes it's not very helpful to compare the same units. Um, I, I want to add an, a different uh, uh, context as well, and that is that is the size of the collaborations working on this, where in, in part from the particle physics community where we do direct detection experiments, they can be hundreds of people working on this one experiment. Of course, in the AMO technique the community, it's often much more, much smaller communities. I'm getting a message from Robert that says like, ah, oh, we need to end at 1 p.m. Do we really need to? Robert, can we just go another five minutes? The, there's less and less questions coming in. Could we take the last three questions? What's the hard limit? Um, okay, I mean, I just wanna be respectful for people's time, but okay, all right. So, so let me suggest this. Um, we, we, we finished the official part, Robert, you do your thing, and then we'll just, uh, the authors and myself will keep on. So if uh, additional people have additional, we can stop the recording then at that time. And if additional people have questions, just stay on. Great. Oh, you okay? So fun. So I, I just wanted to um, thank you, Raphael. You did a great job. Uh, let's give a round of applause for Raphael and for all the speakers. And uh, just an advertisement: we we tend to we're going to try and do this about once a month. We may take a little break over the summer, but um, 
uh, keep an eye out for when we announce these things. And if you have a really, really interesting, particularly if it's an interdisciplinary uh, uh, result um, and you got a nice PRL with it, you, you might let us know about it. I mean, you know, there's, you know, we're talking about one a month, but uh, if you have an idea for one, we'll, we'll listen, we'll listen. And so that's really all I had to say. I just wanted to thank you for attending. And so let's shut off the recording now. Thank you very much, Robert.